for anybody who can't be here today. Um, this workshop is on getting ready for events. Uh, most of us are going to be going to our first FTC events in close to two years. So this is just a chance for some of our alumni and key volunteers to um, talk with the teams and kind of remind you guys how to get ready for events. So to start with, um, I will turn things over to Duncan Silversides, who is one of our robot inspectors. Hello. Um, as I was introduced, I'm one of the robot inspectors um, for Victoria. Um, we're kind of going to go through a little bit of stuff about um, sort of what's different um, between this year and last year, um, what sort of things your team should be looking at uh, before um, the event, um, some of the prep work you should do before you arrive, and then we'll kind of go through the process of um, our, what you should be doing when you arrive at the event and um, some of the COVID safety protocols that we have for this year. Um, and then after that, we'll be doing a quick driver's meeting that'll be run by Kyle. Um, and then after that, we'll have a Q&A session. So um, in-person events, yay! We get to talk to people and see people. Um, one thing that you should definitely be expecting this year that is different is there will be other robots on the field with you, which will be fun. But uh, that also means that there will be other robots on the field with you. So uh, do be aware that any uh, there will actually be robot to robot contact this year. Um, so do make sure that your robots are designed accordingly. Um, things like power switches and main electronics should definitely be inside the outer inside the frame of your robot. Um, another thing that didn't come up last year at all is things like um, your control hub has a specific password and it should be changed. And you should remember this password. Uh, when you're just by yourself, it doesn't make any difference, but when you have multiple robots on the same field, they can, there can be some confusion with connecting to the wrong control hub. Uh, another thing that is very different this year is you'll be going to an event. Um, you won't be running your matches from wherever you usually would hold your meetings. So you need to have spare phones and batteries charged um, and probably should bring a couple chargers with you. Um, bringing power bars and that sort of thing is a, kind of a helpful piece of equipment to have with you. Um, everyone does need to have safety glasses for when they're running the robot and working on the robot at the event. Um, so you should make sure that and double check with each one of your team members that is going to the event that they have um, safety glasses to bring with them or that your team has a collection of safety glasses for everyone to use. Um, for the event, it is really helpful to the inspectors and to the referees and everyone if you actually take your robot through and walk it through a robot and a field inspection if you can as a team. Um, there are some really easy things that will trip a lot of teams up. Um, team numbers are usually something that teams decide to add on at the event when they fail inspection. So it would be really helpful if all the teams show up at the event with team numbers that are two and a half inches high and a half inch thick on both sides of the robot. Um, they also need to have alliance markers this year. So you need to be able to have... Um, red and blue alliance markers on your robot. Um, the specifications can be found in the game manual. Uh, the other thing that is very helpful is to take a tape measure to your robot before the event and check that you are in fact inside 18 inches because you may think you've been inside 18 inches and then find out that someone's added a small piece that now has you at 18 and a quarter inches. Uh, so it is very helpful if um, all the robots can have someone go through with a tape measure and just kind of check that and make sure that you um, comply with those rules. Um, it is often helpful It is um, if the teams uh, update all of their hardware and software. So um, there's the robot control and driver station apps um, and updating to the newest version is usually a very good thing to do right before an event. Um, the other thing you need to do is you need to have all of your team members, this is kind of um, 
more logistics than probably for coaches uh, is all the students need to be registered um, on your team roster through the first website. And that uh, your team also needs to make a plan for how you are eating lunch and where you're going to be eating it and that sort of thing. When you arrive, it would be really helpful if you could all try and find a way to maybe meet out in the parking lot or something and then arrive as a team um, so you can have all the paperwork um, as well as all of the vaccine passports ready for scanning so you can all go through at one time and we can get all of you checked off at once so that we don't have to worry about stragglers coming in late for each team. Um, you will have an assigned pit area at the event and if you could go and um, go to your pit and then uh, start your setup there. And then once you've got set up and things, um, start taking your robot through the different inspections and then get so that you can get ready to r run as part of the um, event. Uh, so when you're going up to robot inspection, um, again, just another reminder, team numbers are required. Um, so are alliance markers. Um, and the last thing is that you need to bring your team shipping element um, up for inspections to make sure that it um, complies with all of the rules. Um, in terms of COVID safety protocol, um, if you're feeling sick, please stay home and get better. Um, it is a good plan for each team to have a backup set of drivers or field coach in case someone is sick the day of the event. Um, you need to be wearing a mask that covers your mouth and nose during the event, um, having your vaccine passport um, either on your phone or printed out. Um, you also need to uh, remember to practice social distancing when you're meeting with your alliance partners. Um, and using hand sanitizer and stuff before placing your robot on the field and handling game elements and that sort of thing. Um, one more thing is that if you want to take a break to get a drink of water, please find a spot to sit down and take your drink and then put your mask back on before moving back out to the event. Um, I th think that's it for COVID safety. Um, I believe the next section is Kyle's with the driver meeting, so I'll hand it off to Kyle. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I just wanted to go over a few of the key things that us were actually watching out for at the event that I wanted to remind teams about. Uh, first of all, Duncan already mentioned alliance markers and inspection, but please make sure you come to the field with the correct alliance markers for the color you will be in your current match. Um, we want to get, we want the event to run on schedule, so be prepared to set up quickly and efficiently and again, while keeping your social distance from the other teams. I realize that is logistically tricky, but um, we need to keep everyone safe and keep the event moving. Um, another really common thing that comes up is uh, once the field has been randomized and we've placed the duck on that barcode, you should not be touching anything in your control system except for pressing that start button when the buzzer goes. So if you are touching your control pads, game pads, or changing your program or adjusting your robot after that point, you will get a penalty and you will not be eligible for the randomization scoring. So keep that in mind. Make sure you do all your setup and program setting and such before you tell the field crew that you're ready to randomize the field. So that is general stuff I wanted to remind people about from past years. There's also a key issue in this year's game that I wanted to make sure people are thinking about is warehouse operations. So please make sure you know the rules about getting freight out of that warehouse and are being careful to follow them. You so start completely outside. That means no part of your robot breaking the plane at the outside edge of the tape. You need to move completely in and then move back out with one piece of freight. Um, before that freight is eligible to be scored. Uh, 
Thanks, everyone. Looking forward to seeing your robots tomorrow. OK, I have a few more questions that have I've been asked in the last couple of days. OK. So one of the questions has to do with the ducks on the carousel and just going through the process of who loads the ducks and when they can be loaded in Endgame. Right. OK, so the who loads the ducks is any member of the drive team. Uh, so your two drivers or I believe your field coach. Um, when you can do that is when the carousel is not moving and does not have a duck already on it. Can it be a member from either drive team or does it have to be the drive team that's right beside the carousel? It can be either drive team, but coordinate with your partner if you, if you want to move through their space. Okay. That is a good point, and I'm not sure how best to handle that, but it can be a member of either drive team, so talk to your alliance partner about how you want to handle that. Okay. Um, by the way, team members who are at the workshop are welcome to put questions in the chat just while we're finishing up the questions that I had in advance, because um, this is your chance to talk to the referees and ask questions. So another one has to do with what is defined as grasping a shipping hub? That is a good question. There is not, grasping isn't a formally defined term in the game manual as far as I've been able to find. So I would probably interpret that based on, is your robot exerting pressure such that it takes force to remove the shipping hub from you? Oh, okay. And then um, what counts as having more than one game element? Like if you pick it up momentarily or it gets stuck under your robot, um, what are the rules about having additional game elements not deliberately in, um, in contact with your robot? Uh, in general, if it's incidental and you're taking prompt action to get rid of it, a second element that's being bumped into or briefly caught under your robot or that sort of thing would be considered plowing and not controlling and would not be a penalty. If, you, if it looks like you are either strategically moving the element to some advantage or it's stuck under there for a period of time while your robot moves significantly and you're not making an effort to get rid of that, that's where we would start looking at penalties for too much possession. Okay. And we have a question from the chat. What if the mm -hmm. robot pushes the shipping hub during autonomous? Is that considered a penalty? If it is inadvertent, that would be considered um, within the expected minor movement of the shipping hub. If your autonomous is doing that repeatedly, we will be asking you to change or not run that autonomous. And what about with the shared shipping hub between the two teams? Um, my guess is that one's going to get bounced around quite a bit. What counts as movement or what would cause a penalty there? I believe if you make contact with that at all in autonomous, that is a penalty. One okay. Moment. In teleop, though. Okay. Um, in, let me pull up the game manual just to make sure I'm getting the right info on that. Uh, this is... Yeah, while we're waiting, a um, good point would be have someone on your team review the game manual and check the rules before you get to the event. That is a very good point. Yes, good plan. That is actually on the final slide. Oh, Great. okay. <laughs> we just skipped to questions, that's all. Yeah. Okay, what game manual wording here is robots may not intentionally relocate or rotate the shared shipping hub. Inadvertent and inconsequential contact is allowed, but intentional movement that affects gameplay is assessed a major penalty. Um, and you also can't interfere or interact with the opposing alliance shipping hub or the opposing alliance section of the shared shipping hub. So, um, as I would interpret that, that means if you nudge the shipping hub slightly while attempting to score on your side of it, 
that's entirely fine. If you are sticking your effectors in the opposing side or pushing across the field, that is definitely not fine. Uh, does that answer the question or is there a finer point you want to clarify? I think I would let team members ask more questions about it. It's just something okay. that we've seen happening, so. Yes. This is a somewhat vague and open to interpretation part of the rules. Basically, I'm, as, unless there is further clarification from first, I'm planning to interpret it mostly based on the, uh, what we can guess of the team's intent and whether the, and the consequence of the movement. So if the shipping hub ends up significantly off its spot in a way that he does not where the other teams will expect, that's not inconsequential. If it looks like you are doing it deliberately, that's not inadvertent. That's basically how we'll be trying to assess this. Um, when the teams come up to the field, is there a process for them for putting their own team shipping element or do they just walk on the field and do it as soon as they've been called to the field? Do they wait for a signal from the referee to actually get on the field? Uh, we'll signal a team when it, we're ready for them to set up their robots and shipping elements. I say at that point, you are free to put your shipping element on the barcode if that is where you want it to be. Um, and are you expecting team members to actually step onto the field to put their shipping element in? If necessary, but keep it to a minimum, please. <laughs> okay. And do they remove the duck that would be there? Sure. The, I'm happy for them to do that and place it with the rest of the ducks or ask the field crew to do that either way. I think for social distancing reasons, it likely makes sense to just have the teams do that. Okay. Well, it'll be really interesting if none of these teams have questions tomorrow for our referees. Yes. <laughs> I hope that means everybody's read the game manual thoroughly and they all know their stuff and that tomorrow will go super smoothly, right everyone? Okay, can the, can the pre preloaded box touch the ground as well as the robot? I believe so, let me confirm. Gee, how about if we have teams type their team number into the chat if they already have team numbers on their robot? Ooh, good idea. <laughs> so far, I see no one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 17453 has it. Yeah. Yes, the preloaded box must touch or be possessed by the robot. So it can be just on the ground and next to the robot. Oh, St. Margaret's does, 3491. We have a few teams with team numbers on the robot. So if the teams that don't have team numbers on the robot could work at least a little bit on that either tonight or tomorrow morning and get those on, that would be appreciated. Oh, Matheson does, because I was going to say the other three teams have so far all been Victoria teams. So at least one of our teams on the lower mainland has team numbers on their robot. So it sounds like, Kyle, this will be your issue tomorrow. Yes. Um... Those who don't have that, it really makes a big difference for the refs keeping track of what's going on to be able to identify which robots belong to which team. So those team numbers are important and please put them on your robot before tomorrow. Um, I probably know the answer, but just so the teams know the answer. 
If your robot is spinning the duck carousel and the duck actually lands on your robot, is that a penalty? What happens? Yes, if the duck lands on your robot before it touches the floor, that is, um, that duck is controlled by your robot and has not touched the playing field. So that would result in a minor penalty for that duck. Now is, just to clarify, is that if the duck then gets scored or if the duck just lives in the, on the robot for the rest of the match? That is, if the duck ends up controlled by the robot before it touches the playing field, regardless of what happens to it later. Okay, awesome, thanks. Okay. And if that duck stays on the robot, are they allowed to pick up other ducks or other blocks and balls and score them? No, as long as that duck is on your robot, that is your one control piece of right. So don't do that. <laughs> okay, we have a couple questions in chat. How many matches will each team play? And I don't know if Kyle actually knows the answer. I do not. We are expecting teams to play six matches. Um, but if something happens, we may actually end it after five matches if the event is running late. So a lot has to do with how quickly the teams get in, get registered, and get their robots through inspection. The sooner we start matches, the more likely you are to get to play six matches. There is also the chance that due to the number, the exact number of teams showing up at events, teams might play surrogate matches and play more matches relative to other teams, but it's because we need to get four robots on the playing field. But a team who plays a surrogate match, their score is not included in their rankings from the event. So even if one team happens to play seven matches because they're a surrogate, they would only have scores from six matches included in their rankings, not from the surrogate match. And we have another question. Is blocking the space between the barrier and the wall allowed as it does not obstruct all paths to travel to the warehouse or area? Yes. Uh, that would not be considered trapping. That said, if your alliance partner is also blocking the other exit, that probably is. Is it? Because um, there is, t robots can go over the barrier. If the robot, right, yeah, that's a good point. No, that's fine. So simply blocking an entrance or exit of the warehouse is not is not blocking all all access points to a robot. That's right. Okay. I have a absolutely off the wall question, and I'll ask both you and <laughs> Kath this question. Kath is also a referee for Victoria. Um, what penalty do you hate giving out the most? That's a good question. I know. Uh, I can tell you which penalty I try not to give out. Okay. But that, that is um, starting gameplay late or early. Um, so like robots moving right before the beginning of driver controlled or like just after like um, you're also supposed to stop your robots at the end of the two and a half minutes. And a lot of teams just put their controllers down and don't actually turn their robots off. And we should actually be giving penalties for that. But most times we don't even notice until we, until the team is trying to drive the robot off the field when we tell the teams to clean up. So please turn off your robots uh, at the end of matches. Uh, and then I don't have to even think about giving out those penalties. That is a good point, Kat. And my least favorite penalty is probably the related one of touching your controllers after the randomization or during the autonomous period, which happen, has happened a lot more than it should at early season events in past years. So please remember not to do that. Yeah, so if you touch your uh, controllers after the field is cleared and we're trying to do randomization, we then both have to give you penalties. Do we have to re-randomize this year or not? Uh, let's not re-randomize. Let's just go straight to 
you're in eligible for the randomization score. Okay. Yeah. So is there a penalty as well as not eligible for the randomization score? Yes, you get a minor penalty and ineligibility. Okay, we'll give teams one more minute to ask questions. Um, I should clarify that because uh, that maybe sounds like a harder line than I mean to take. If your robot is having problems and you think you need to fix it, talk to the field crew and we'll sort you out. But don't just start sticking your hands in your robot or your control system or you will get that penalty. Okay. Um, Matheson has asked a question which is, is there a charging station by the driver station? And so your team is going to be competing at Kelsa Secondary on the lower mainland. We expect that each of the pit tables should be close to a power outlet. Make sure you bring an extension cord, but there is no reason there would be a charging station as part of the queuing table or the actual driver station. Um, you're both your uh, you would have a driver hub and your robot battery should be charged sufficiently before you get queued for your match. And FTC batteries last much better than FRC battery batteries, which I think is where that question is coming from. Um, yeah, most times your FTC battery should be able to last you through multiple matches, but it is a good plan to have a couple of charged batteries so you can swap them out if they start to get low. And it's a good idea to check that before and after each match. What is your voltage on your battery? Because it just displays that and you can just check that really easily. Just a, and this might be something that you can start doing at the scrimmages tomorrow, is knowing what battery level your robots run decently at because this might be the longest time you've run your robot for, depending on how your team is set up and how long you have for meetings. So either just to keep notes of how the robot fared during the match, or if you're able to actually measure the voltage, go ahead and do that. But it, you can, you know, figure out a game plan for later events. We will be trying to have a 15 or 20 minute break in the, in the so like probably play about three matches and have a short break. So if either your battery or your driver hub is beginning to get low, that would be a time when you could actually plug them in and get them charged what, during the break. And that isn't enough for a full charge, but it will probably get you through your next matches. So we have another question in the chat. During autonomous, is the carousel duck allowed to be launched outside of the game field? <laughs> I think we need more clarification of which direction the, like, how the duck okay. is launched. I, yeah. Let's simply, let me, we'll wait for the clarification, but let's assume that an autonomous robot goes up and is expecting to spin the carousel so that the duck lands in the field, but it turns out it's reversed and suddenly the duck is falling out of the field instead of into the field. So the robot has gone the wrong direction, basically. Right. So that's an error, not a deliberate launching of ducks. That makes sense. And I, do, I think that would be fine, though, of course, not valid delivery. Deliberately removing a game element from the playing field would be a penalty. But if it's accidental, the only cost to you is you don't get the duck. Also, the scenario that Christine put forward, um, the duck is moving at a speed we're expecting ducks to move at, for lack of a better yeah. phrasing. The phrasing, <laughs> yes. the phrasing of launched makes me wonder if safety rules need to get implemented. Well, the other thing that, ma that made me think about is if someone had like a geared up duck, like carousel spinner, and it spins the carousel so fast, the duck just falls off it before it enters the field, because it's spinning so fast. Yeah, that does sound like what they're talking about. I would say if the duck goes flying enough for it to fall under launching scoring elements, that would be both a penalty and probably a reinspection. Yeah. Okay. There is um, 
some rules about launching elements in the game manual. If yes. you are worried about this, please read them and then look yes. through and see if your robot follows them. This yes, and they boil down to don't. This year is a year where game elements are not allowed to be launched. Yes. Um, here's a following on question. If at any time a duck falls off the back of the carousel, like let's say the person puts it on, but it's only part way on and when it starts to spin, it falls out. Are they allowed to pick that duck up and when the carousel is stopped, put it back on and try to score it? Good question, let me confirm. So basically a duck that fell off the carousel outside of the field, are team members allowed to pick it up and put it back on the carousel following all other rules? I believe so, because that duck has not been delivered. That is not supposed to happen, but as I read the game manual, if it does, once the carousel is stopped, you would be allowed to place the duck back on the carousel and try again. Okay. So the only thing that I would say about that is if when the duck falls off the carousel, it rolls away, the team member is not allowed to leave the carousel area to get to the duck. That is a good point. If okay. that happens, at, if, if that happens, ideally just grab a different duck. If it's your last duck, it's probably fair for one of the field crew to retrieve it for you, but don't go chasing after it yourself. Good point, Christine. Okay. That said, you still shouldn't be spinning the carousel at speeds that cause the ducks to go flying far away from your driver's station. <laughs> To be honest, the ducks have a bit of bounce in them. So if they land on the wrong angle, they could actually end up almost rolling. So. Right. <laughs> but that's different from launching and flying. Yes. Considering that it sounds like we're almost finishing up, I would just want to remind teams that if you have questions, you can talk to referees before or like during driver's meetings, being in the day, but also you can we will hopefully remember to make driver or question boxes yeah, that you can yeah. approach a referee uh, with one team member um, and talk about how a match went or talk about some rules. If you have a specific rule or Q&A, if you can bring it up on a tablet or a piece of bring it on printed copy, that is always easy so that we can see the wording right there. But we will try and answer your questions as much as we can. That is another thing um, for any of the rookie teams or experienced teams that have just forgotten about it because of seasons. There's a Q&A online where they talk about a lot of clarifications to these rules. So if you look at uh, a lot of the questions that you have have probably been asked by other teams and have been answered on the Q&A forums. So I did just switch to the final slide, which is read the game rules. Yes, game please. manual part one has the tournament definitions and rules, the robot rules and robot inspection um, checklists are all in the appendixes of game manual part one. Game manual part two has the game specific rules and the forum uh, answered questions form part of the rules for how we, our referees will interpret the game rules this year. Okay, I and do I, not see any, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, and one last reminder, if all the teams that don't currently have team numbers on the robot, please remember to put them on the robot. <laughs> Thank you, Duncan. Yes, you need to pass inspection. I really hope that all the Victoria teams show up with numbers on their robot because Duncan is an inspector in Victoria. So he is going to be uh, <laughs> looking for you guys to have your team numbers when you arrive. Yeah, and I'll be doing the same in Vancouver. Yeah. Numbers. Okay. Um, that is the end of our question or our presentations. I am not seeing any more questions in chat. So I want to thank everybody for coming today and wish you all good luck tomorrow, those teams who are competing tomorrow, and good luck for those who are competing next Saturday. And thank you, everybody.